Hi boys and girls, we're going to pick up on the hope chest at chapter 12. Um, we left off on chapter 11. Chapter 11 is where um, Violet finally finds Chloe. She finds her in Nashville and she sees her at the Hermitage Hotel where she was staying because she kind of got swept up and um, scooped away by uh, a Miss Charlotte Rowe who turns out to be an anti-suffragist. So she, Violet, over the during the last chapter in chapter eleven, realized that um, a lot of these laws and rules that women had to follow, and men got to make all the choices about, she felt weren't really fair, and she realized that she was here at the she was there at the um, Hermitage Hotel with this woman Charlotte, who was an anti suffragist, but she ends up finding Chloe there at the hotel, and they. Um, they reunite and Chloe takes Violet back to her hotel to sleep for the night. So chapter 12 is called Violet Spies. Violet spent a hot, miserable night sharing a bed with Chloe and thinking that it would have been a cooler at the Hermitage where you did not have to pay for the fan. But in the morning, Violet had an idea. She woke up stiffly next to Chloe, who, had still st who was still asleep. The young woman was walking around the room eating a bowl of grape nuts. Violet figured this woman must be Miss Lewis, who Chloe told her was the lady who had the other bed. Violet dressed hurriedly and walked, wanted to run out, of, out to the train station to start looking for Myrtle. But Miss Lewis insisted that she should eat some grape nuts first. They were supposed to be very good for you. There wasn't a spoon or any milk, so Violet scooped them up out of the bowl with her fingers and chewed while Miss Lewis talked. Today is the fourth day the legislature has met. Miss Lewis said. We were hoping it would be all over by now. The first day they tried to pass a joint resolution in Tennessee House and Senate, and we thought we had enough votes, but the antis have bribed a lot of men we were counting on. She wiped a hand over her forehead, which was already sweating. How long will they meet for? Violet asked. We don't know, said Miss Lewis. The Senate and the House have to vote separately now, and they each have to pass the amendment. And we... Don't know when they will. The antis are trying to bribe as many legislatures as they can, and they won't let up, let the vote happen until they're sure they can win. Aren't the suffs bribing legislators? said Violet. She was too tired to think straight, or she would have realized how rude this sounded. Certainly not, said Miss Lewis. Women are entering politics to clean it up, not to add to the filth. When women vote... There will be no more bribery or corruption. There will be no more war. The concerns of mothers will become the concerns of the government. Good schools, safe food, and temperance. Just think, the United States has banned school alcohol completely, and soon temperance will spread to other nations, so that nowhere on earth will all, will all will mankind ever be a slave to alcohol again. Violet had finished her grape nuts. Excuse me, Miss Lewis, she said. I need to go to the train station. I'm sure those aunties aren't going to use every dirty trick they can. I'm sure those aunties are going to use every dirty trick they can think of to block the legislature, said Miss Lewis, seeming not to hear her. If only there were some way we could know what they were planning. As she walked along, Violet reflected on what she had sat in on the anti-meeting last night, eating sandwiches that nobody had ever noticed were there. She was perfectly set up, Violet thought, to be a spy. She could go back to the hermitage, pretend to be an anti, and tell the suffs what the antis were planning. She wanted to do something to, to help, since meeting that hatchet-faced woman in Chattanooga yesterday, she found she cared about the suffrage very much. It was more than just a newspaper story to her now. Violet looked at the rail yards that she was walking past. She saw two hobos walking along, carrying small bundles under their arm. They looked like they had just gotten off a train, and they reminded Violet of Hobie, the hobo. She wondered if he had gotten to Florida yet. The smaller hobo let out a cry and grabbed the bigger hobo's arm, pointing to Violet. Violet started. Hobos could be dangerous. She'd gathered that much from Hobie who had been careful not to let her and Myrtle meet any other hobos. 
She turned to run. Violet, called the larger hobo. And relief washed over Violet. She ran toward them, the gravel roadbed crunching under her feet. It was just, I was just on my way to look for you, she said. We shook those Palmer agents, said Myrtle. They're running around Tennessee backward looking for us. She pointed back down the rails toward the freight yard. We rode in a caboose. But, Violet looked at Myrtle and then at Mr. Martin. They were rather soot-covered, though not as much as Violet and Myrtle had been after riding in the blind behind the engine with Hobie. Mr. Martin, you jumped off the train. I saw you. So the hobos actually weren't um, hobos. They were Myrtle and Mr. Martin, just a little sooty. Mr. Martin shrugged and smiled. Sorry to scare you, Violet. I had to make it look like I jumped so that agent would leave us all, leave us all alone. I went over onto the steps of the vestibule of the connecting car, then climbed up onto the roof and rode there till the next stop. Then I got off a different car. And you told us it was dangerous to ride freight trains, Violet said. Mr. Martin shrugged again. Well, it is. Have you um found your sister yet, Violet? Yes, said Violet. She's at the Tulane Hotel. It's just up the hill there. She'll be so glad to see you. Violet wasn't sure if this was true, but it was the sort of polite thing she'd always been taught to say. Chloe was just coming down the stairs in a big wooden paneled lobby of the Tulane, wearing her blue, sky blue walking suit and the straw hat with the yellow rose in it. She still looked exhausted, Violet thought. She looked like she hadn't slept at all. Chloe got to the bottom of the stairs and stopped, looking at Mr. Martin for a moment, as if she wasn't sure who he was. She didn't notice Violet and Myrtle at all. Violet watched Chloe and Mr. Martin look at each other, the desk clerk and the drummer. And the drummer he was playing cards with, too. Chloe's mouth opened a little bit, and she froze. Mr. Martin turned faintly pink under the train soot, and Violet could almost hear him wishing he had stopped to wash his face. Chloe's face turned pink, too. Theo, what are you thinking? Helping my sister run away from home. He didn't help me run away from home. I did it by myself, Violet said, annoyed. Chloe spared Violet a glance and then looked back at Mr. Martin again. I'm delighted to see you, too, said Mr. Martin sarcastically. Theo, you shouldn't have left New York, Chloe spoke very quietly. And Violet guessed she was trying not to let the desk clerk and the drummer over here. I wasn't aware I needed permission to leave New York, Mr. Martin said. Theo, stop it. What happened? Did the federal agents find the safe house? No, your sister came crashing in on me. Violet felt she had by no means come crashing in, but the way the two of them were glaring at each other now, she didn't really want to get involved in their discussion. Why didn't you send her home, Theo? Because it's impossible to make you headstrong Mayhew women do anything you don't want to, said Mr. Martin testily. I see you're still thinking in terms of making women do things, Chloe snapped. You're com that's completely unfair, and you know it, Mr. Martin said. Violet and Myrtle exchanged glances. Unfortunately, this was enough to draw attention to Myrtle. Hey, the desk clerk barked, and everyone turned to look at him. Uh-huh, we don't allow them in here, he pointed. They all stared at him. You mean Myrtle, Mr. Martin said, in a dangerously gentle voice. He stepped over and put his hand on Myrtle's shoulder. If you don't mind, we're trying to have a conversation here, said Chloe to the desk clerk. Have it somewhere else then, said the desk clerk. Not in my hotel. I happen to be a guest here, said Chloe. She put her hand on Myrtle's other shoulder. Not if you're going to bring in coloreds and parade them around the lobby, the desk clerk snarled. Yeah, this is a high tone establishment. said the drummer, shuffling the cards and pushing his hat back on his head. Have you eaten? Chloe asked Mr. Martin. No, we were just going to look for something. Do you need money? I mean, to get the child something to eat, Chloe said. Violet noticed they were both looking at Myrtle now and that neither of them seemed angry anymore. No, thanks. I have. Are you going to get that colored kid out of here? 
or I'm, I'm going to have to call somebody. The desk clerk asked. We're leaving, said Mr. Martin. I'm sure we can find some place where they'll take our kind in. Even in Nashville, he added, giving the desk clerk a nasty look. Can't imagine where, said the desk clerk. There's colored hotels, of course, but you ain't colored. I don't think I like Nashville, Myrtle said to Violet when they got out into the street. I'm not so sure I like it either, said Mr. Martin, overhearing her. Well, it's your own, Chloe started to retort, but then seemed to think better of it. Nashville, Nashville is where it's all come down to, Theo. We're going to win or lose everything in Nashville, and I'm staying right here until we do. Mr. Martin went over to the curb. How's the old hope chest holding up? Chloe followed him. Pretty well. I replaced the black brass radiator with one of those steel ones you suggested. Excellent, Mr. Martin stroked the radiator. And I was right, wasn't I? Yes, said Chloe finally. It hardly ever overheats now. Violet noticed that Chloe seemed suddenly happier and much less tired than she had a few minutes ago. Myrtle noticed too. I don't think your sister is going to send Mr. Martin to the right about, she murmured. No, it's the car she's sweet on, not him. Violet said. Uh-huh, said Myrtle, skeptically. We should drive her out to the country, take a picnic, said Mr. Martin. There are some beautiful places east of Nashville. And I could teach the girls to drive, Chloe said. At the word, the girls, Mr. Martin turned around and looked at Violet and Myrtle. He had clearly forgotten they were there. Let me get this one something to eat, he said, and find a place to park her. There has to be a hotel that takes white, white and colored in this town somewhere. Violet watched them go with regret. She hadn't realized it until now, but she hadn't seen a single colored person at the Hermitage or the Tulane. She was sorry that Myrtle wasn't going to be able to stay with her. Maybe when women get the right to vote, they'll be able to change that. 